Well, I, uh, feminism is very close to my heart because I believe in it not only as a theory or a set of theories, but also as a set of practices. And it's really rewarding, although very challenging in its own unique way. Uh, so it gives me a lot. And then I also love uh, existentialism. So I like teaching the phenomenology and existentialism class because I tend to see the world through that sort of a framework myself. Existentialism is basically a very broadly a theory where you try to deal with the meaning of life without having a preset group of beliefs or truths that you can import into your experience. So it's a way of trying to find a way to make meaning in your life without a preset plan, without a pattern to follow. And it sort of opens up a lot of different possibilities. It opens you up to the ideas of freedom and transcendence and the artistic creation of the self, but it also causes a lot of uh, questioning and um, wondering about the nature of the universe that I like. I find it to be more honest because it sort of starts from the premise that we don't really know why we're here and we have to do a lot of work to figure out the answers even if there may not be any answers. I really love philosophy and all I want to do if I could do anything is just talk to people about philosophy and students in particular and I love being in front of students and I love being in a classroom and I love the moment when all of a sudden we're all talking about something and the lights are going on and their eyes are opening big and they're talking to each other and I live for that. Mm -hmm. And I love it when, when the whole class all of a sudden has a collective aha moment. And so I'm motivated by that, that experience. Well, in general, I do a lot of continental philosophy and we tend to, to appreciate a lot of art and so in general, I'm very uh, moved by uh, art objects and by artistic movements. And so uh, I particularly have very recently become interested in earth art uh, and uh, the works of people like Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with the Spiral Jetty, which is in Utah, mm -hmm. and I've been questioning a lot uh, his ultimate program that he had, Robert Smithson had, for the uh, Kennecott Copper Mine, that he was going to do earth art there. And so art in general has been very um, formative of my philosophical position. But I'm also really interested in things like advertising on the more nefarious uh, mm -hmm. level of theory. Uh, I'm completely captivated by advertising and the way in which it invades and colonizes our imaginative spaces. And so I, uh, I try not to subject myself to too much of it, but I do watch uh, advertising specifically with the idea of trying to find ways to deconstruct it and to teach my students and my children really uh, ways of being able to critically get, get some critical distance from advertising as a way of finding their own ideas about what they want and need in the world. Well, one of the things that I do, one of the assignments that I give in my feminism class, for example, is I do a, a section on uh, Simone de Beauvoir's discussion of myths and the myths of femininity and, and women. And I just say to my students, and I say this every time, uh, go just get magazines. In fact, any magazines will work, but if you want to use, uh, in particular, magazines oriented towards women, those usually have really striking examples. And just see if you can find any examples of these uh, images, these myths of, of women and femininity that Beauvoir talks about, such as women as objects of nature, like pearls or feathers or stones, or women as animals, or women as the sea, or as the sky, or as Eve, or anything. And every time I give this assignment, and I've been giving it now for years, I think to myself, well, maybe things will have changed. Maybe I won't find these examples. Maybe they're not there anymore. And I'm, not, I'm amazed that not only are they still there, so women wrapped up as, as you know, in seaweed emerging from the water or uh, women of darker skin color dressed up like panthers and cheetahs. Uh, not only are they still there, but they're worse. 
They, it's, it, it's almost as if I find, and my students find with me, that the further we think we get as far as liberating ourselves from the stereotypical images of femininity, the more they reappear in these ways in advertising and cinema and television shows. So we, we can push down the mole, the whack-a-mole here, and it just pops up over here. And so I find that images oriented towards femininity in advertising, and you can see these in commercials too on television, that those remain important cultural objects that require us to investigate them. One thing is, and this is so hard to do, but one thing is that you can't set out from the very beginning in a boardroom saying, what's the way that we can make the most money? Mm -hmm. Because the way you're going to make the most money is by causing, not always, right? It's not across the board. There are ways of making a lot of money and still being incredibly uh, fair and open-minded and pluralistic and, and, and not misogynistic. Uh, but if that's your primary goal, chances are you're going to find ways to exploit as many fears and insecurities and stereotypes that you can because people will will feed off of that. So the one thing you can't do is have that as an, as an artist be your primary goal. Uh, it can happen down the line somewhere because if you make a good product, people are going to want it, period. So that's probably the one thing that I would say. And then also have, have people who are thoughtful contribute. So don't just have advertisers and executives and uh, uh, people who, are, who have the bottom line as their sole interest uh, be a part of the conversation. Bring in academics, bring in artists, bring in students, bring in children to say, hey, these are the sorts of things that we would like to see that might actually cause some degree of good and not simply exploit. Well, I would say, in all honesty, Socrates. Uh, when I first took my very first intro to philosophy class, I was so taken by the story of this man from Athens who was so convinced that asking about questions of virtue and goodness and justice and friendship and love were so important that asking those questions was so important that he refused any other sentence but death because he was challenging the status quo and the powers that be to such a great extent. That he would die for that. And that, that really got me. And so all of the rest of it, I would say, has been following Socrates. But then there's been plenty others. I mean, as far as my position with feminism, Simone de Beauvoir was the one that opened my eyes in a way that had never been opened before. I mean, I simply didn't see the world in any way as problematic between men and women until I read her, her, her uh, book, The Second Sex, in, uh, in, in college. And that, that sort of brought me to a new level of critical thinking that I had never had before. I think that what it did was Socrates showed me the value of critical thinking. And by critical thinking, I mean the ability to not accept the given as given, but to challenge it and question it and make other people see that we have to ask questions of, of our world and our families and our communities and the universe as such. And once I saw the value of that, I saw the value of philosophy as something that everyone should have and everyone should be exposed to and that we should all be practicing. Not that we all have to agree, in fact, why would we? Nobody ever agrees about anything, but that it can teach us how to question, how to respect other questioners and how to sort of join together in dialogue and argument and, and truth seeking and, and bring us together instead of divide us from each other.